No, we're going to do multiple integrals. Iterated. So we, we just spent all of chapter 13 learning about derivatives with multivariable functions. We did all kinds of derivatives, chain rules and, and uh, maxima, minima, all the different things we can do with, with derivatives. Now we're going to look at integrals with multivariable functions. So with integrals, we, we end up doing multiple integrals with, with multivariable functions. And we're going to, we're going to look at... We're going to look at uh, definite integrals only for now, uh, because when we do uh, when we take an integral of a multivariable function, our constant of integration is another function, so that that makes it a little more a little more difficult. So for now, we're just going to we're going to look at definite integrals. We'll talk about how we find the a constant of integration as a function a little later. So let's look, we're just gonna I'm just going to do some, do some examples of integrals with multivariable functions today, just as, as kind of an introduction. So let's look, at, um, let's look at a few integrals. So we're going to integrate from e to the y to y of y ln x, natural log of x, over x dx. So we're integrating and we're assuming that we're assuming that y is greater than zero. So we're integrating with respect to x. When we when we do an integral like this, when we have a multivariable function and we're integrating, y, uh, x is our variable. And y is constant. So it's just like we did when we when we worked with um, partial derivatives, where we hold y constant and we take the derivative with respect to x. Here we're holding y constant and we're integrating with respect to x. So we have to kind of turn around turn around our thinking a little bit. And our limits, let's say our limits are functions of y. The functions of y, y is constant with respect to x. So these are the, our limits of integration are constants with respect to our, our variable of integration. So that doesn't give us a problem. So I'm just going to rewrite this as y, since y is a constant, e to the y to y of the natural log of x over x dx. And when we integrate this, this equals y over 2 natural log of x squared and we're evaluating that on e to the y to y. So if we, if, if we needed to look at our u substitution we could say u is natural log of x and du is 1 over x. And y is just a constant. Now we're going to plug in our limits and we get that this equals y over 2 and here it, it might help if you if you need to when we're working with multiple integrals we end, up, we end up doing triple integrals we could write x equals and x equals so our limits are with respect to x so x equals and x equals to remind us that we're substituting these in for, for x. So when we substitute these in, we get y over 2 times the natural log of y squared minus y squared. So that's what our integral evaluates to. 
and we end up with a function of y. Any questions on what we what we did there? <clears throat> Sometimes it can be it can be not difficult, but it's just a little different way of thinking when we think about our our different variables and what's constant and what's a variable and what we're what we're substituting for when we do these kinds of kinds of integrals. So let's look at another example and then we'll talk about our iterated integrals. So let's look at the integral from 0 to x to the third of y e to the y over x minus y over x dx. So here, um, I'm sorry, this should be, I want dy. Here y is the variable and x is constant. And if we needed to, we could write our limits of integration just to remind ourselves y equals and y equals. <clears throat> and this can be helpful when we start doing double and triple integrals to remember what what variable we're talking about on our limits. So we want to do, do this integral with respect to with respect to y. What do we have to do? Use Wolfram alpha. This is um, integration by parts. So I'm going to say that um, u equals y, du is dy, uh, dv is e to the minus y over x. And remember, we're, we're y is our variable, so v, we're integrating this with respect to y, is minus x e to the minus y over x. So my integral um, if we take if we take the derivative of this of e to the if we take the derivative of this with respect to y the x is just like it's like one half it's a constant. All right, so my integral, uh, the integral of y, I'm going to drop my, my limits just while we, we write this, y over x dy equals minus x y e to the minus y over x minus the integral of minus x e to the minus y over x dy. So we rewrite this minus xy e to the minus y over x. And remember, I'm going to put my limits in at the end. I'm just leaving them off here as we do this intermediate step. Plus the integral of x e to the minus y over x dy. And this integral, we're, we're integrating with respect to, we're integrating this with respect to y. So this is just going to be minus x squared e to the minus y over x. Because x is constant with respect to y. Or when, we're, when we're doing our integral with respect to y, x is constant. If we integrate this, or I'm sorry, if we differentiate this with respect to y, um, one of our x's cancels out and we get a change in sign. Now we're going to put in our, evaluate over our limits. So we get minus 
x, y, e to the minus y over x minus x squared e to the minus y over x. And we're evaluating that on our limits where y equals 0 to x to the third. So we're going to plug, all, plug these, our limits in for y. And we finally end up with minus x to the fourth. I'm going to move over because I need a little more room. Minus x to the fourth, e to the minus x squared, minus x squared, e to the minus x squared, minus 0 minus x squared. And finally, we get x squared. I'm going to factor out an x squared times 1 minus e to the minus x squared. minus x squared, e to the minus x squared. And we end up with a function of x. So we do our, we integrate our multivariable function with respect to y, and we end up with a function of x. Uh, let's see, this x squared, right. Questions on, on that evaluation? I'm, I'm going to predict that what's, what's going to be, what's going to be tricky about these as you start doing them is just keeping straight what's constant and what's variable as you do these, as you do these integrals. After you practice a little bit, it'll <coughs> become a little more, a little more natural. So uh, in our first example, we integrated with respect to x and ended up, our, our answer was a function of y. Here we integrated with, this, with respect to y and our answer was an, a function with respect to x. So we could then integrate this function with respect to x. In our first example, we could integrate our answer with respect to y. So we could integrate with respect to each variable in turn. When we do that, we end up with what we call an iterated integral. So let's talk about those. So it's the same idea. We just integrate a multivariable function with respect to one of the variables. We end up with a function of the variable we did not integrate with respect to. Then we can integrate with respect to our new variable. So we'll look at a couple of examples of iterated integrals. And our notation here is I'm going to do from 0 to pi, integral from 0 to sine x, 1 plus cosine x dy dx. So that's our notation. What this is telling us is we're going to do, we do these types of integrals inside out. So I'm going to integrate this inner portion first. And then I'm going to take that answer and integrate that answer with respect to x. So this is, we, in, we integrate this inner integral with respect to y. We end up with a function of x. And then we take that integral with, we end up with a function of x, take an integral of that function with respect to x with the outer, with the outer parentheses, or the outer integral, I guess. So our original, our inner variable is going to be with respect to y. And our outer variable is going to be with respect to x. So well, let's do the inside. Let's do the inside integral first. So I'm going to do the integral from. I'll do that one in red. Integral of zero to sine x of one plus cosine x dy. 
y is our variable, x is constant. So this just equals y plus y cosine x evaluated on 0 to sine x. And when we evaluate that, we just get sine x plus sine x cosine x. <clears throat> so that's our inner integral. Now we're going to do the outer one. So we're going to do the integral from 0 to pi of sine x plus sine x cosine x dx. We end up, we take our integral with respect to y, we end up with a function of x. Now we're going to take the integral of that function with respect to x. And when we perform this integral, this just equals um, minus cosine x plus sine squared x over 2. And we're evaluating that on 0 to pi. And when we evaluate that, we get 2. <coughs> So the inside variable gets, gives us a function of, the inside integral gives us a function of the, outside in, of the outside variable. And then when we evaluate that outside integral, we end up with, in this case, we end up with a real number. Yes? You, yes, you could do that. Now, what we're going to do next is give this, give what we're doing here, a geometric interpretation, and show how we're going to use use this this in interpretation of a, of an integrate iterated integral. So you, you could technically do that, and you end up just with a some some multiple multiplication going on. But we'll give this a geometric interpretation. Um, so questions, questions on what we did here. And like I said before, we could have, in order to keep our, our variables straight, I could have written my limits here, y equals 0 to y equals sine x, and x equals 0 to x equals pi, to keep, keep my limits straight so we remember what our variables are and what our constants are. If that helps, you can definitely do that. Yes. You could just keep nesting integrals and integrals and integrals. We're just going to go do triple integrals. Is what we'll end up doing. We're getting we're getting close. All right. So we will talk a lot about regions when we do when we do multiple integration. The region of integration. The region of integration is just the union of the, inter of the intervals of our two integrals. So our region, our region of integration is just the union of our intervals, our limits of our, of our two integrals. And like I said, we're going to give that a, a geometric interpretation here in just a second. So in our last example, our region Our region is 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to sine x 
union, this big U means union, 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi. And we can also, just as a heads up, I think these might come up in your homework a little bit. If you have, I'm not going to go clear through this, but just something to watch out for. Our region can be infinite. So if we had something like this of 1 over xy dx dy, this is a double improper integral. And you have to use your techniques for improper integration on each, each integral. So your, your, your region can be infinite. And remember, when you do your improper integrals, you set up a dummy variable and take the limit as that variable approaches. In this case, it would be infinity. So you have to use your techniques for, for improper integrals with each of these, each of these integ iterated integrals. All right, so let's give a geometric interpretation to these iterated integrals. We're going to look at the area of a plane region. So we're not just arbitrarily choosing to, to put these two, these two integrals together. We're doing it for, for a specific purpose. So let's say we have, we have a region in the plane. So here's my, here are my axes. And we have a couple of functions. And this is, we'll call this first one g2 of x. And this first one, this lower one, g1 of x. And we're going to, just like we d you've done before, we want to find the area of this region from x equals a to x equals b. So in order to do that, we divide it into these little rectangles. Their thickness is dx. And we have a technique for finding the area of this region. You guys know how to do this. You've done it. You did it in, in calculus, calc 1, to find the area between these regions, between these two curves. So we're going to look at this in terms of double integrals. If we wanted to find the area of one of these little rectangles. We just want to find the area of one of these. We could divide it into little, um, little rectangles this way with a height of dy. And we could sum all those dy's from this function to this function. So we could write that the area of this little strip, this one strip, Our area is the integral from g1 of x to g2 of x of dy. That's going to give us the area of this tiny little strip. And that just gives us y evaluated on g1 of x to g2 of x, which is just g2 of x minus g1 of x. And then we're going to, in order to find the area of the region, so we found the area of one strip. To find the area of the region, we sum all of these strips of width dy from a to b. So the area of the region is the integral from a to b of g2 of x minus g1 of x 
dx, which is just your familiar formula from Calc 1. Now we can put these two together. We combine these two. to write that the area of the region is the integral from A to B of the integral from G1 of X to G2 of X dy dx. And this is an iterated integral. So we can think of our iterated integral as the area of this region. And the boundaries of our integral define, define the region. So our region goes from x equals a to x equals b, and from y equals g1 of x to y equals g2 of x. So we're, w the way we're going to use these iterated integrals is to think of them as bounding a region in the plane. And what we're going to end up doing is, one, we know already that this gives us the area of a plane region. We're going to find the value of a function above that plane region. We're going to sum that function inside that region in, that's bounded by that region in the plane. So we're going to have, say, a paraboloid above some region in the xy plane. And we're going to do an integral of the value of that function bounded by the region in the plane. So that's one way we're going to use this. So this is our, this is our geometric interpretation of our iterated integral. This is, is, is the area of a plane region. So if we go back here and look at our integrals, the f our iterated integrals, so this tells us that y is between 0 and sine x, and x is between 0 and pi. So if we look at that as, as a region in the plane, I'm going to go forward. Well, I'll just do a little sketch here. So y varies from 0 to sine x. So we have uh, there's sine x. And x is 0 to pi. So here's 0 and here's pi. So we're finding, we're evaluating this integral over, over this region. That's what that's our geometric interpretation of this iterated integral is. And for this one, this one we have a function, a function in here. So this would be the value of this function on the entire, um, on the entire first, first quadrant. x equals 1 to infinity and y equals 1 to infinity the value of this function on the entire first quadrant. So that would be the geometric interpretation of that iterated integral. And we can also bound our, our region rather than by a function above and below, a function of x above and below. We could, have, we could bound it on the right and left. And if we do, in that case, our axes would be, we'll set up our axes here. And we just do our integration in the opposite order. So here's x and here's y. And here are our two functions. And this is, we'll call this h1 of y and h2 of y. And our boundary this way is call this C and call this D. So the area of this region from y equals C to y equals D and x equals h1 of y to h2 of y. If I draw my little, a little representative rectangle of the area that we're trying to find, like so. There's my representative rectangle. That's my dy. 
the area of this region is the integral of from C to D H1 of Y H2 of Y dx dy. x varies from h1 of y to h2 of y, and y varies from c to d. So that would be my area of, of this region. So it just, this just switches around the order of integration. In our previous one, our order of integration was dy dx. Here it's dx dy. So when we look at our look at iterated integrals this way, we want our inner inter integral to be a function and our outer integral, our, our limits of our outer integral to be constant. So our in, limits of our inner integral can be functions. The limits of the outer integral need to be constant with respect to both functions if we're thinking of this as, as an area. We call this type of region, not that it, it comes up just a little bit, this kind of region would be called horizontally simple. And our first one we call vertically simple. Because our representative rectangles for our area here are vertical, and here our representative areas are horizontal. So this is horizontally simple, vertically simple. Our representative areas, uh, representative rectangles are horizontal. Questions? All right. Homework. That's it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about iterated integrals tomorrow. So tomorrow and when tomorrow, uh, we're, we meet on Wednesday. Odds for tomorrow? I can't remember now. Well, but anyway, we'll talk more about these the next time we meet. Um, now, where we're, where we're going with this, I gave you a little, a little a little idea previously. We're going to find the value of a function bounded by a region in the xy plane. Um, and then we're going to talk about surface area and volume with iterated integrals. We can use a triple integral to find volume. We're going to define a surface area increment on a surface and use iterated integrals to find surface area. Uh, it's going to expand our ability to find surface area of, of complicated, complicated surfaces. And then what we're going to do in chapter 15 is put together what we learned about vectors and what we're learning about multiple integration. And we're going to integrate vectors over surfaces. So that's, that's what we're kind of, that's our ultimate goal is, is to be able to put our, what we do with vectors with what we're doing with multiple integration.